Welcome everybody to the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network. Today I'm uh, excited to introduce our speaker Primo Shkraba from Queen Mary University London and he'll be speaking on algebraically manipulating persistence modules and a Minkowski type bound. Thanks Primo. Uh, thank you Henry. So uh, originally the thought behind this um, behind this presentation was really to kind of not really give new results, but just kind of overview existing ways to think about persistence modules and manipulate them, um, mostly because I've realized that some of the results now are older than I would care to admit, because that kind of says something about how old I am. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I thought about how it would relate to a specific, kind of a more recent result, because it's always fun to kind of introduce at least something new in a talk, uh, and that's that's the second part, which is a, a Minkowski type bound. Now, when I was creating, when I was making this talk, I realized that maybe what would work better is to give the Minkowski type bound, and then kind of illustrate how we can manipulate uh, persistence modules in proving this bound. So uh, that's the kind of I, I've kind of flipped the talk a little bit on its head, but uh, mostly the, the goal of it will be to prove one specific theorem, uh, and in doing so, basically go through and understand how, you know, how these actual manipulations of persistence modules go. Uh, and, and I think it's um, perhaps not the most useful result, but it's certainly, I think, a very cute result that people should know about. Okay, so as I said, our goal is to prove this Minkowski style bound, uh, and the key bit will be that you know, like the talk says, it's going to involve persistence modules. Um, and basically, as we go through, I'm going to highlight what these different manipulations mean, how we can think about them, and also try to highlight um, where we need to be careful of intuition and where we need to do actual computations. So that's kind of the goal of this talk. Um, if there are any questions or anything else that's not clear, by all means, just stop. Okay. So a good place to start is what is the Minkowski inequality or Minkowski bound? Uh, so the classic one says that if you have two functions in some LP space, you have the triangle inequality, basically. That's, that's what the Minkowski bound is. And we're going to want to prove something similar for persistence modules. Now, a priori, it's not at all clear what this should mean for, um, what this should even mean for persistence modules. And I'll define it, but uh, you know, uh, before we get there, it's gonna we need to kind of do a little bit of work to at least get on the same page about uh, what the various definitions and what the actual settings setting is that we're working on. Okay, so you know the the starting point of all this is a persistence module, and I think everyone here knows. Um, you know, but at this point, I think it's fair to assume that everyone knows what the definition of a persistence module is. Um, in retrospect, there's been kind of, there's various levels of abstraction and various levels of generality that one can define persistence modules as, but um, primarily we're gonna work over, you know, vector spaces where you have some ordered partial order and actually we can even assume a total order. Um, for most of the things that I'll be talking about, we're going to assume that this index set is discrete, uh, which is kind of the very classical setting. So I will point out which results kind of hold more generally. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, we can just think of this persistence module as kind of perhaps arising from a discrete filtration, uh, but it doesn't need to be that way, right? It can be kind of any algebraic structure. And, Part of the things that I think that make this type of thing interesting is precisely when we don't have the mapping back to a real topological space or a persistent homology, but we really just have this algebraic structure. And so there are settings where we might want to kind of deal with these types of things. And so it's good to understand that as well. Okay, so usually, and, and one thing that I'm going to kind of go back and forth on is we don't necessarily just care about uh, 
persistence modules, and why is this not going? Um, why is it not going forward? It's still, did it go? No, okay, there we go. Um, right, it is that we usually care about diagrams or barcodes, right? And what we usually say is that if, if the module is nice enough, um, then we can decompose it into these intervals, which we can visualize, and, and we can kind of take a look at those, right? So uh, the way to think about this is that I have my module, I have my module X, and I can basically create this diagram, which is a bunch of points above the diagonal, um, and this really completely describes all the structure that I care about in the module. Um, so there's a lot of different classes and generalities of these kinds of modules, as I mentioned. So probably the, the few that I know of, so I'm certainly not the expert here, but there's QTAME, there's pointwise finite dimensional, there's finitely generated, finitely presented, and a, a whole bunch of other things. And there's a very nice paper um, that kind of goes through a lot of these different things and describes how they're related. Uh, but for the most part, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about finitely generated, and I will mention where certain results can be extended to pointwise finite dimensional. Now, while in some sense this finitely generated or finitely presented uh, assumption is perhaps somewhat restrictive, um, it is the setting in which we usually do computation. So when you sit down either at a computer or if you're working things out by hand, uh, it's generally the first examples we, we would compute would be finitely generated because these are things we can write down. So it's, it's I think, a very convenient place to start to actually think about manipulating persistence modules. Um, and then, you know, once, once you have a good idea of how this works, then one can start to work towards generalizing these operations and trying to understand what happens in, in these more general settings. Okay, so what is the, so I'm gonna mostly talk about finitely presented modules and the way to think about this is that I have this finite numbers of points or bars above the diagonal. Um, I don't care necessarily about the diagonal. Uh, so, you know, for people that uh, are familiar with this, you know, the, you can ask various questions like, Am I assuming decorations? Am I assuming open or closed intervals? All sorts of things. For the most part, I'm not, I'm going to gloss over these details and just consider things that are off of the diagonal that have some decoration, but I don't really care about the decoration. And uh, I think once I get to the bound, the theorem that I'm trying to prove, it will hopefully be obvious why I don't care about them, okay? So um, going on from that, what's going on here? Uh, sorry, one second. Okay. So yeah. So why is this? Why is this not working? Hold on one second. Let me plug in my iPad. Yes, this no is, worries. Yeah. So let's stop the share and then. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess we're, you're going to have to see the, the interface, but that's fine. Um, right. So, so we have, uh, so the key bit about this finally, finitely presented modules is that this actually goes back to the, one of the original papers by uh, Carlson and Zomorodian, where if our index set is discrete, we can literally think of this as uh, just a module over a graded field, so the KT modules. Uh, 
Uh, and one thing I want to kind of point out is that most of the computations that I do are precisely in this setting. Um, I'm not going to go through kind of hand weight, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to work out specific examples, but whenever there's, um, whenever there's any ambiguity about what the answer should be, uh, I want to kind of highlight that this is probably the place to start to do some computations to see if intuition actually is what we would expect it to be. Okay, so th that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so now we get to, you know, it, in, if we recall in the original thing for, uh, we want to prove a Minkowski type bound, so we want to define what the norm of a persistence module is, right? So again, we, we have some nice module that's this collection of birth and death times. Uh, and so we need to define the norm and the norm that we're gonna define is just gonna be, uh, so we're gonna define the P norm of a module simply as uh, the sum of death minus birth to the power P, one over P, right? Uh, so what is this? Well, this one can think about the, in some sense, the pth distance, the pth power of the distance to the diagonal, right? So it's, in, in, we're taking literally the death minus birth, so the lifetime of, the, of each bar, taking it to the power p, summing up and taking the pth root. So this is what we're gonna define as the norm. Uh, it's also called the total persistence and it has some other names as well, uh, but my claim would be that this is actually a very fundamental uh, quantity, right? So before I get to kind of, um, I'll give kind of two examples of why this is uh, something reasonable. So the first one is just the zero module. So if I think about zero as an algebraic module, right? So it's an abelian category, so it should have zeros. And uh, so the zero module is really just the empty diagram, right? It's just the diagonal because all the death minus birth are just zero because it's the diagonal. And so it has norm zero, right? Which is something you would want, right? The origin should have, in some sense, zero size. So that's kind of the first thing. And then a second thing, and this kind of goes back to older results, is to say there's actually relation, an algorithmic relationship to the amount of time it takes to compute a persistence module. So not, not for just any filtration, but if we think about the very standard idea of, let's say that I have a filtration uh, where I add simplices one at a time. So I can think of this as a sublevel set filtration where each simplex is assigned a natural number, right? So in the order that I add simplices. And this is a persistence module that I'm going to define as F. And there's actually a very old result. Well, very old. There's, an, there's a result in the first, um, in the first persist, one of the first persistence papers by Ilse Bernard Lecher and Zomorodian, which basically says that the, so the standard algorithm takes O of the two norm of F squared, right? So, right, e essentially what we've said is that if I have this uh, persistence module, then if I take the two norm, so basically I, I take the lengths of the bars squared, that actually gives me a bound on the runtime of the algorithm. So this was, you know, it, there's no theorem in there, but it's kind of given as a, a offhand remark in the paper. So, so this has been known for a long time. Okay, so now we know what the norm is. Uh, we know what, we, what we're dealing with. So what's the actual result that we're going to try to prove? So the main theorem is, let's say that I have three persistence modules, um, so, and that I have a short exact sequence of them, right? So I have zero to A and to B to C, right? This, this is a short exact sequence the bound is essentially going to say that the direct sum of A and C is upper bounded by the norm of B. And then the triangle inequality is going to hold for this. So A, basically the norm of A plus the norm of C 
upper bounds the norm would be, right? So this is what I would call a Minkowski type bound, right? Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go through a few special cases first, like the infinity norm, uh, but I, I think the most interesting part of this is this lower bound when P is not equal to one or infinity. So when it's, let's say two or three or something like that, and we'll see exactly how to prove that uh, in, in as we go on, okay? Okay, so if we wanna understand exact sequences, well, we need to understand morphisms of persistence modules, right? So uh, this, again, the, the kind of first paper was in 2009, where basically algorithms were given for the, to compute these three things, right? So if I have uh, basically, um, it's given in a slightly more restrictive setting, but in, in principle, the, the algorithms are already there. Uh, so basically given a, a morphism between persistence modules, I can compute the image kernel and co-kernel um, in, in, in some very nice way. And the way to think about this, and here I have the simplest possible persistence module of just one bar, x is one bar, y is another bar, time is going, is upward, going upwards. And so, well, the image, right, is going to be this bit, actually, you know, just on the right-hand side. Uh, the kernel is going to be this bit, and the co-kernel is going to be this bit, right? So I, I can decompose these things into images, kernels, and co-kernels, and these are all going to have barcodes themselves. Um, so, you know, the image of F is a persistence module, the kernel is a persistence module, uh, and so forth. So, so you do have this. Uh, now, the important thing to keep in mind and something that uh, will come up a bit later is that essentially the key, the way I've drawn this morphism is not arbitrary, right? So if I have um, this kind of thing, right? So this type of thing is a valid morphism because if I take this element here and map it forward, I get some element here, I may get zero up here, right? But this diagram will commute, regardless of where I choose x's and y's. If, as, as I shift over to the right, no matter how I do it, since I can only go up, I can only go forward in time, this sort of thing will, all, this sort of diagram will always commute. Whereas if I had something like this, right? Um, and then I can choose points like that, I can actually construct numerous things that don't commute, right? Right, because I have zero, so I have zero here, here I have x, x, y, y, right? And I see I actually have two, two squares that clearly don't commute. So this, there's no possible morphism other than other than the zero morphism between something like this, right? Uh, so, you know, there's clearly structure here. And again, for people who've worked with modules, this is not terribly surprising, but, you know, I, I still think it's worthwhile saying. Uh, the interesting thing is that when you, if you're thinking about, uh, so these are for when time's going up and you have homology, whereas when you have cohomology, all the arrows switch and one needs, and, and morphisms that are valid are exactly of this form. Okay, so one has to kind of make sure you know which way you're going in order in, in order to make sure what are valid morphisms. In uh, and one other comment that I'll make is that in terms of you know we're very used to dealing with interleavings, but interleavings as morphisms in terms of where you're where you're not allowed to go forward in time, but you just have to kind of go across interleavings in this sense are not actually valid morphisms. Um, one needs to then do kind of various shifting and reparameterizations in order to make it work. And, and things can get a little more complicated. And I'll, I'll say a few things about that in, in a few slides. Okay, so uh, here, you know, I, I took very simple modules uh, with one bar each, and you could see, well, there's this kind of matching going on between bars. Um, 
right? We can do, um, and, and the, it's a valid question to say that, can one always do that? Uh, the answer is, for the most part, yes, but one has to be careful. Uh, the full kind of theorem can be found in this paper. Uh, there's this kind of a long discussion about these kinds of matchings, but there's also kind of a short answer. And, and I've already kind of said it in that, um, you know, image uh, kernel and co-kernels are persistence modules, right? So since they are persistence modules, they also have barcodes, right? And they're, there's a, you, if you're taking an image of two nice modules, then the image is also nice. Um, and so, you know, they, they are persistence modules, so they do have these decompositions and uh, one can understand it as kind of sub bars of, of barcodes. But again, we're gonna kind of see how, when that intuition breaks down, uh, it still holds, everything I've said actually holds, it's just it can be very easily misinterpreted. Okay, um, all right, so we have, we've seen this. Uh, so now kind of going, trying, we've seen morphisms, but now we wanna connect it back to exact sequences. And uh, I wanna point out that, you know, if we have, if we have a morphism between persistence modules, or actually just generally, if we have a morphism, we have associated exact sequences, right? So there's two kind of, I would say, canonical uh, exact sequences associated to a morphism. Uh, oftentimes you see this as a sequence with four elements, but I'm gonna write it out separately. Uh, and if we take this kind of example that I had before, right, of, of this, actually both of these exact sequences look exactly the same. It's going to be something like this. Oops. Um, yeah, sorry. So like that and like that, right? Um, right, so both of these actually look like this. And if I actually number them one, two, three, four, the first one is going to be, um, so this is gonna be three, four, two, four, and then two, three. Whereas uh, if I write out the second one, it's going to be, um, right, two, three, uh, what is it, one, three, and the co kernel is one, two, right? So they look the same, and here we kind of see where the matching of bars actually starts to break up, right? So we see that this bar in the middle, in both cases, kind of breaks apart into two pieces. And getting a hold of this phenomenon is kind of a critical bit that we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on, okay? So, in order to understand these pairings and uh, kind of start to work with this, uh, again, one, one very useful thing if we have finitely generated is that we can write down a presentation. So for any, and this goes beyond persistence modules, this is just a general algebraic fact, that if I have some mod, finitely generated module, I can write it as generators and relations, where each of these things is freely generated, which essentially means that I can write it down in term, I can think of it in terms of spans and bases and things like this, which makes it much easier to actually compute with. So in terms of persistence, what this means is that, you know, I, if I have a bar like this, well, I have the generator, which is the birth time and the relation, which is the death time. And the bar is really just the co-kernel of this. So, an, an, Another place that, and actually I'll, I'll call it a projective resolution later, this is kind of a special case of that. So, you know, this is one way to think about bars and we're gonna use this um, in order to prove our bounds, kind of to, to actually do computations. Uh, oddly enough, I, we gave a, I gave a talk on this with uh, Mikhail Vedemo Johansson at ATMCS in 2010. Well, whenever I was in Edinburgh, um, 
And yeah, we, we were specifically already talking about this and how one does this computationally then. So this is kind of a rehash of that. Um, okay, yeah, so we have our module and we see that it's essentially just a co-kernel, okay? Okay, so now how do we do images in terms of this? Uh, how do we understand the image of a persistence morphism in terms of this, right? So I can take a, free, a presentation of A, a presentation of B. So this is all the birth times, all the death times of A, birth times of B, uh, death times of B, right? And what I'm really doing is if I want to write down what the image is, I just need to write down what the relations uh, what what the yeah what the death times are of the image and what the the birth times are of the image now um, if I'm in the case where these are really coming from some sort of homology uh, where I have some chain comp underlying chain complex uh, I, I don't even really need to worry about this map in between because these generators and relations all live in the chain complex so in some sense the row space they, they have the same row space. So I can literally, if I have the bases, I can figure out what the map is in between. Uh, in more general settings, one needs to figure out this information from elsewhere. But in principle, if I can write down the relations and the generators, hopefully I can figure out what the map is. Okay, so for the image, right? Well, the generators are just, so let's call this F f of g and f of r. So again, because things are freely generated, I can just take the basis g of a and apply f to it, right? So it's the image of f of g. And the relations are just um, r b. So the relations of b restricted to whatever this subspace is. And you know this sounds fairly abstract, but in principle, you can sit down and write this out, right? I take a basis, I apply my map, which is now just another matrix, so I multiply by something, and then I restrict to that subspace. And now I have relations and generators, and it, there, there's a canonical matching, and that actually gives me the barcode. And that's the way to think about it, right? So the co-kernel, just for completeness, right? What it's going to be is again the generators are just going to be is just GB, whereas the relations are going to be the span of RB plus uh, F of G of A, right? Uh, and here I mean really vector addition because it's really just the span that I care about. Okay, so I. You know, one can translate all of this into just pure matrix operations and actually compute it, which, you know, once you've done a few times, I think takes away a lot of the mystery involved. Um, just again, for completeness, the hard one actually ends up being the kernel. Uh, so for the kernel, uh, what we need to do, and let me just make sure I have all the notes here. Um, right, so, for the kernel, the generators is the span of, so again, let's name things, uh, R, I, A, I, B. So it's going to be the span of F, G minus I, B, right? So one way to think about this is as the pullback of G, B, G, A, R, B. Right, so the the generators of the kernel are the pullback of these two, right? So, and then you, one just takes uh, the relations of A, and we have this map, and that gives us um, again it's some restriction of this map that's going to give us the the relations of the kernel. So the point that I want to make here is not necessarily to kind of give the complete picture of it, but um, to illustrate that the kernel is significantly more complicated than the other two. And if you actually go into the original paper, you see the algorithm there is more complicated um, and kind of convert dually, 
if you do things in cohomology, it's the co-kernel that ends up being the most complicated. Okay. So and Michael just helpfully linked to your, uh, your old uh, paper with him. On our yes. Guys. So for that paper, I think it's a very useful thing to look at, but there's plenty of mistakes and please do not cite it. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but I do think it's kind of a useful way to, it has a lot of useful examples and perhaps one day we will actually get around to fixing it. Um, okay. So kind of moving up one level of abstraction, there's one other characterization that I think is very useful. And that comes from this induced matching paper where rather than finitely generated, everything applies to pointwise finite dimensional modules. But there's this one bit in, well, there's two bits in there that we're gonna use. Uh, the first one is that if you have an injective morphism, it's gonna map deaths to deaths. And if it's surjective, it's gonna map births to births. And again, in this kind of simple bar picture, right? Remember an injective map, one way to think about it is that it doesn't map anything to zero, but in the picture that I drew, if, if some element should never map to zero, well, that means that it, it has to be, the deaths have to be the same because otherwise at some point it will map to zero. And kind of surjective is, is the dual case, which means that births have to map to births because the entire interval in the codomain has to be covered, right? So if that's true, then the births have to match up, right? And it, it's rather, you know, it, it's rather convenient when you're working with these because you can really think of these now as set maps of mapping births to births and deaths to deaths. And it's, it's a very useful kind of thing to do have. Okay, so now, you know, we've spent half an hour, I have about 20 minutes left. Um, so now we can actually prove the theorem we have pretty much all the tools we need to prove this theorem. So first we're gonna do the, the case of the infinity norm, which is actually an easy case, but kind of starts to highlight the types of things that we're gonna do, okay? So here we have our short exact sequence, ABC, and the, the statement that we want to prove, okay? Um, so as I said, now we have all the tools, I'm gonna introduce one more tool. Uh, so another standard, result that we know and love is bottleneck stability, right? To say that if you have epsilon interleaved modules, um, that the bottleneck distance between the diagrams is at most epsilon, right? And um, again, in the same paper, what, what uh, Bauer and Lesnick showed was that if things are epsilon interleaved, there exists this single morphism characterization of interleaving, which there exists this function from x to y or y to x, but where you have to shift one of these in a certain, you know, you either shift x up or y down, depending on how you're looking at this, and then you can show that this morphism exists, and uh, even more so that if you take a look at the kernel and co-kernel of these, the maximum of those two are going to give you exactly the distance. So they really showed that if you, you can really think about these things, start, you can start to think about these things in terms of these short exact sequences uh, or just more generally exact sequences and that you can start to kind of get a handle on it through these kind of algebraic language. Okay. So, so these are, I, I think, hopefully fairly well-known results in the, in the audience. Uh, but this is this was one of the things that we're going to need to prove the result. Okay, so first we're going to prove the upper bound, right? So again, here we have our we have the kernel of f, right? So x and y, if they're interleaved, this exists, and we have our short exact sequence. Okay, so now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to say, okay, well, the norm of x is well, that's just the distance to the zero, right? Actually, it's, it's twice the distance, the bottleneck distance from x to zero. Remember, if I, it's just the lifetime. So if I take, you know, it's half the distance, then I, that's the distance to diagonal, essentially. One can work that out. But now I have bottleneck distance, which I know is an honest to God distance. So I know that this is going to be less than twice the bottleneck distance from 
of, uh, so, oh, sorry, so it shouldn't be x, this should be y. Mm, yeah, this should be y, right? Uh, so take, let's say, the bottleneck distance from x to 0 plus the bottleneck distance from x to y, right? And I could have done this with z as well. It doesn't really matter. Um, but, right, th this is just the triangle inequality for distances. But once I have this, well, twice the bottleneck distance, if I just kind of multiply this out, the first term is just going to be the norm of x, right? Oh, sorry, and I shouldn't put p here. I should put infinity, right? So I have the infinity norm of x. But, well, if, if I look at this, well, let's say I set this thing to 0. Well, x is now injective. That's fine. And if I set the co-kernel of f to z, well, that's just this bit, right? So this term is now just upper bounded by, um, is just upper bounded by, what is it? Uh, sorry, so by z, right? So I get this result, okay? Um, I know that there's these two there's, uh, we're not gonna worry about these factors because it's, one has to be a little bit careful about how one defines these things, but in principle, this, this should give us a bound, right? This should give us this upper bound and we're not gonna worry about these factors in front, okay? So that, that's the upper bound, right? It's just the triangle inequality of, um, of bottleneck distance, okay? How about the lower bound, right? So this is kind of another, this is perhaps a little bit stranger, but the way to think about this is that what is the infinity norm really doing here? Well, it's picking out the maximum length bar, right? So say that uh, the, the longest bar uh, is, in Z, is in X, right? Well, there's this morphism, right? So this is an injective map because it's a short exact sequence. Right, so it's this longest bar is going to have to map to something in X. It's going to have to map to something in Y, but the bar in Y has to be longer or at least as long because of uh, because of what it means to be a persistence morphism. Right, if if this was shorter, this would no longer be a persistence morphism. So that the longest bar cannot be in X, right? Unless it's the same length, unless you have equality. And the other example is, well, the other possibility is that the longest bar is in, is in Z, right? So, and in this case, it's, it's a surjective map. So again, right, the birth times are gonna match up, but, you know, if this is Z and this is Y, again, the bar in Y has to be at least as long. So you can't actually have the inequality go the other way. And these two facts together and the fact that the fact that if this was if this inequality was the other way, you simply wouldn't have a persistence morphism that would be possible, and and that's essentially the proof for the lower bound. Okay, so it's very short, it's very easy, you know, and, and we're going to kind of go on from here. So the other case that's very easy to do is the lower bound for when p is equal to one. Okay, so um, and this because again you have this equality you have equality in terms of set maps, in terms of sets of births and deaths. And one can work this out kind of from exactness. Um, and once you realize that you have births and deaths in this kind of, you know, as sets that they're equal, it, it becomes very easy to prove this lower bound, right? And we'll, we'll do it. It's literally one line. So if you have uh, x and one is just the sum of i and x, di minus bi plus the sum j and z, uh, dj minus b, okay, right? But again, I have the same deaths and births in my, um, in y. So I can rewrite this as k in y, dk minus bk, right? It's just, I'm just rearranging these various quantities in a different way. And so I, I get exactly at equality of y1. So in, in for p equals one, there's a lot of things one can do that make that are just very easy because you can just 
you know, shift around and rearrange things as you'd like. Okay, so that's great. So now we have the upper bound for P infinity, the lower bound for P infinity, and the lower bound for P in one. So now all the other cases, unfortunately, get a little bit trickier. So the upper bound, uh, I'm not going to go through the full proof because I want to concentrate, I want to spend the last 10 minutes on the lower bound. But, and plus, so it depends fundamentally on this result that uh, Catherine Turner talked about in December, where essentially we proved that one can replace, um, in a lot of cases, if you have this sort of, the same kind of single morphism business that you have for, um, for infinity norm, one can usually do something similar with these exact sequences with the P norm for, um, with the P norm and Wasserstein distance, which, which between modules and between diagrams. Uh, so once you have this result, the proof is essentially uh, just, again, the triangle inequality, um, where you know, one has to be a little bit careful about how one does these, dis uh, how one has various factors. But in principle, all you're really doing is you're saying, oh, I have, um, you know, I'm going to take the, the y is essentially going to be, so y of p is going to be equal to some constant times the Wasserstein distance of y to zero, which again is going to be upper bounded by this constant of, uh, let's say, x to x to zero plus x to y. And then one can rearrange these things in the right way in order to get the bound, the upper bound. Right? And this holds, uh, this holds for basically all p greater than one, greater or equal to one. So, so this upper bound, I think, is is kind of the same idea as before. You just need to work a lot. You need to work harder, and it's a little less clear because of this connection with Wasserstein distance. So now, finally, I want I, this is the kind of main bit and the part that I think is the most interesting. Uh, is the lower bound for p strictly between one and infinity, uh, and here it's it's a little less clear, right? So here I have this nice example of a short exact sequence, and where I have two bars that have that have flipped in some sense, and you can check that this is actually a good short exact sequence, and you know it's not when you look at this, it's not at all clear why this should be the case. So first, let's see if, if it's even true for this case, okay? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that here I have the same example with ABCD with the values ordered in the way that they are. And I want to show that this thing, right? I, I wanna show that D, that D minus, I guess, uh, yeah, so D minus B plus C minus A is less than D minus A plus C minus B, right? And, um, you know, this seems reasonable, but it's, it's, it's not at all clear why it should be true. Um, and it's, let me see where we are. Um, right, so there's a fun trick involved with kind of proving this. Uh, so the trick is, so the trick is to notice that uh, since, C is less than D and A is less than B. This implies that uh, B minus A and D minus C is bigger than zero. And if you multiply this out, what you get, what, what you get, and let me just make sure is that I, essentially the cross terms, so you get A plus B plus, uh, oh sorry, C plus B plus A, D is less than DB plus CA, right? Okay, so you have this in a, or less than or equal to, sorry. So if you have this, if you have this, if you multiply these out, these are exactly the cross terms one gets when you multiply this out for, uh, so for P equals two, right? So if you set P equals two and expand this out, um, you know, the, the cross terms you're going to get are exactly going to say this. So this observation essentially just proves this. Now, 
doing it for more general P is a bit more work, but, uh, and you know, we're, we're, I'm not gonna go through it, but in principle, it's the same idea. There's some kind of argument for convexity, but the P equals two case is the important one. Okay, so this, so that's kind of one bit of convex analysis. Uh, that one can do, but then there's this other thing that's called the rearrangement inequality, which I thought was really cool. So it's it's a very general statement that says that if I have um, a1 through an and b1 through bn, and I'm trying to match up the a's and b's, right? So let this pi be a matching, right? The if I want to maximize um, pi of a minus a squared, the pi that does it is going to be exactly, um, is going to be exactly b of n plus one minus i minus a of i, right, squared. This, so what does this say, right? So I have a's, right, and let's say, so these are a1 and a n, and let's say this is b1 and b n, right? What this says is that it, it, this type of matching, right, is exactly going to be the one that maximizes this. And if you're interested, this can all be found in, in a book called the Cauchy Schwartz Masterclass, which is a very nice book to read. Um, right, so once you have this, um, this is, ends up being kind of the critical bit that lets you prove the general lower bound. Okay, so yeah, so this is what I just said. Uh, so the outline of the proof now is, okay, so we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the direct sum and then we're gonna do all of these flips like we saw before, right? Where we had these pairing switches and we're gonna show that each time the norm increases, right? And that's gonna give us our lower bound. The problem is, is that it's not clear that we can always construct these things via pairing flips, okay? So the last thing we need, and I'm running out of time here, uh, but what we need to know is that we, we're not gonna really do it combinatorially, we're gonna do it algebraically. Uh, so there's this notion of group extensions where if you have two short exact sequences where X and Z are the same, you can look at all possible Y such that this is actually, such that this commutes. And, you know, you, you define equivalence classes of this where you have an isomorphism between y and y prime, and not just y and y prime, but you, you, you need this isomorphism to commute in this diagram because otherwise it doesn't work. Um, and there's a very classical result in homological algebra that you can find in uh, Weibel's Introduction to Homological Algebra that says that equivalence classes, these equivalence classes are exactly one-to-one -one correspondence with this x of z x. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go through the definition of x because uh, it's not particularly important. Um, but the way one does it, rather than actually give you the definition, I'm just going to kind of show you why it works. Uh, so you start off again with Z, and by the way, this can be found, this is kind of copied from Weibel's book. Uh, what you do is you take this projective resolution of Z, right? So we have this short exact sequence X, Y, Z. We apply HOM, and if you apply HOM, uh, you get essentially this, there's this long exact sequence involving, involving HOMs and X um, that, you know, again, is not particularly important why it exists, but this is the important bit of it and that you get this X of, and I guess this should be Z, sorry. Um, so Z like that. Um, with HOM of the relations on Z to X and the generators of um, Z to X. So what this looks like, what essentially says that any map that I put here, any map gamma, will give me an equivalence class of Y, right? Which I'm gonna kind of put in as Y. So essentially I can choose, as I put in maps here, I get to different Y. So when I think about just this kind of example I had before, 
right? What I'm really doing is I'm saying by putting in a gamma, I'm mapping this thing to this thing, right? Which is exactly this short bar here. That's when I put in this short, when I, when I put in this relation, which is this gamma, out pops this persistence module, okay? So that's kind of the, there's a lot of work involved in there, but luckily it's all done for us by homological algebra. So when one does this, the key bit is then, you know, you work through this again via projective resolutions, and I, I realize I'm already over time here, so I'm gonna just kind of skip over it a bit. But in, in principle, what you're really doing is you're just gonna order the relations, all the pairing switches that happen in increasing time. So you're gonna take the death times of Z and order them by increasing time, and you're gonna add them into this gamma one by one as a basis, okay? And for each one that you add in, you get a new module. And after you've put them all in, you're guaranteed to have gotten the thing that you actually wanted to show in the beginning, okay? Uh, so the, you know, in each time you need to, you, you get a, all sorts of changes. And these were described again, kind of in 06 by, uh, in this Vineyard's paper that, you know, again, it's not a theorem, but it's, it's kind of described in detail how these pairing switches can occur. Okay, so just to kind of, I'm um, basically done, the key idea why this should work and kind of just to tie this together is that when I put in a relation, I'm essentially putting a pivot in and I can only affect things, generators that are before me and relations that are after me. So essentially there's some sub matrix that's gonna look like the entries, the new pivots are gonna be along the diagonal. And kind of when one unpacks this, what this really means is that a cascade, after I put in something, the, everything that's changed is going to look like this. It's going to be a sequence of bars that are, in, that, that are kind of included in one another, right? So this is what it's going to look like, okay? And once you have this picture, well, that, that was the whole point of the, the rearrangement inequality, right? Which tells us that of all the pairings in, in this set that could have happened, this is the biggest one. So the norm has to have increased. And so you end up with the, the, the requirement that the norm is actually bigger, okay? Okay, so, you know, there's a simple corollary of this to say that Essentially, the trivial extension is, has the smallest norm, which I think is in itself interesting. Um, and unfortunately, I won't say anything more about that because I'm out of time. Uh, but you know, just to kind of conclude, um, I, I think it's very interesting that these short exact sequences give you both upper, not just upper bounds, but lower bounds as well, which is, I think, something we haven't really explored very much. Uh, and the other part that, you know, unfortunately, I ran out of time for the, the uh, this kind of, to kind of go through the, the X a little more carefully, but um, you know, when one wants to unpack this in a very nice way and understand all these pairing switches and everything that can happen, it's really the KT perspective that can help you kind of understand this. And you know, th these are the computations that I did to kind of unpack this. It's not just kind of that it, it didn't just magically pop out of nowhere. Um, so I think with that, I'm basically done uh, with a few minutes over. Thank you very much. So before we get to questions, everybody please briefly unmute yourself and let's applaud and then you can mute, mute yourself again. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, <laughs> questions for uh, Primoz? Okay, we have a question in the chat bar. So Jacob Legoni asks, is it possible that the lower bound is an equality if and only if the extension is the direct sum? Um, it's, I think one could construct examples where, you know, you, you essentially have pairing switches that don't have any effect, um, but, I think up to, 
Yeah, I, I, I believe up to, um, you know, if, if you avoid things on the diagonal, it should be an if and only if. It, right, so it, it, as soon as you have, because I can have non-isomorphic modules that, uh, that have distance zero essentially, right, or zero plus, um, then these types of things won't, you know, these norms won't, won't capture that. But uh, if, if you're talking about, you know, bars that all have non, that have non-zero distance, then yeah, then it's an if and only if, or it should be. Primoz, a question I had was, um, do you think any of these bounds hold in the setting of zigzag persistence, say between diagrams of the same type, or I know multidimensional persistence has a lot of challenges, or multidimensional setting? So I believe for zigzag it should, right? So I mean, zigzag modules as such, again, because none of these things particularly depend on um, particularly depend on the underlying chain structure, right? So, I mean, it, it doesn't have to come from persistence. So if you have a zigzag type that's finitely generated, it should certainly hold, right? Now, the question is, I think in zigzag is more, how do you, what are reasonable places where these exact sequences arise, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, it, it's like, the, you know, for zigzags, in some sense, we have the pyramid theorem that tells us that, I mean, you know, if the zigzag comes from a Morse function, for example, we have some notion of stability for it, right, just by various equivalences we know. Um, but, you know, that's one case where this notion of interleaving kind of naturally comes over, whereas I think a lot of the challenges for zigzags arise in, um, you know, arise in what a reasonable notion of interleaving is that gives you something meaningful, right? So in some sense, I've hidden the answer is yes, but kind of the, the, the asterisk is that I've, I've hidden all the hard parts because I've said that the situation is nice enough and I have this kind of short exact sequence, right? Um, and, and likewise, the lower bound should hold, is a purely algebraic statement, so that will hold for zigzags. Um, the multidimensional is an interesting case. I do expect it to hold with a factor, um, at least the upper bound. I, I, there's a good indication to believe that it should hold. The lower bound is a little trickier and, uh, I mean, even the upper bound is a little, you know, it, it is a little hard to quantify because you're, you need to first define what it means to be for the norm, right? So here we have this kind of very clear thing of deaths and births. Um, you know, I know uh, Peter has done some work on kind of defining Wasserstein distance for in general. Um, and, you know, the, I think there are a lot of reasonable choices, but um, I don't know what the right kind of answer is or where it kind of breaks down. Um, in, in principle, it should work. But, you know, it's, it's a non-trivial extension, and I certainly wouldn't claim that it just follows immediately. Um, mm -hmm. The lower bound, I think, would be much harder to show because for multidimensional, you don't have this kind of, you know, in one-dimensional modules, you have x1 and then zero, <laughs> whereas for multidimensional, um, again, things become a little trickier, right? Uh, but it's certainly, you know, it, it's something that once... Uh, Kate and I finally do put the paper up. Uh, we, you know, I, I think it's actually even written in the discussion that this is clearly an interesting question to follow up on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More questions? Questions. 